two. Oh, you're going to record this on me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. You All right, monster. if you're comfortable doing it on recording, let's do this. Three, two, one. Happy birthday to you. To you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to day. you. This is this always works so well. This is easy. Happy this is exactly what you deserve. To you. <laughs> oh, it's good. Happy birthday well, to you. Well, that me. was a anyway. thing. <laughs> Thank you. I can think of How nothing you know? more appropriate for CZ. <laughs> We needed just a little more sass in there, but all right. Have all right. So uh, hopefully you're all able to get to that internet website uh, and are able to log in. And I guess I should share my screen. That would be a good start. So I can hit this button here uh, and I can hit uh, hello there. And I can hit that. And hopefully, uh, how's my font size? Looks good. All right, cool. I mean, you'll see the same things. So you don't really need to follow along what I'm doing. Now, um, if anyone is having problems getting and logging in and getting access to a workshop environment, um, make some noise. Uh, we will sort of have a bit of intros, so we'll have time for people to get in and catch up. Um, either use chat or unmute yourself and squeal or whatever you feel appropriate. Um, so if you click on this slides button, uh, you will get a set of slides that pop up uh, and these will accompany what we're doing. Uh, you don't really need to look at these. Everything that's important uh, will also be on the left. Um, but as I'm going through the workshop, uh, we will use the slides um, because there are a lot of more descriptive parts versus the workshop, which is just, you know, copy and paste, click button, type some things. Um, then if you click on uh, editor, you'll see that we have a embedded version of uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, so if there's ever a point you need to edit the file and you're not comfortable using Vim or VI or Pico or whatever other um, text editors are in the terminal, uh, you can always come here. Um, for example, we have some examples like so, right? And there's some YAML and you can do some stuff. In the terminal, we have two terminal windows, um, terminal one and you click down in the other one, terminal two, pretty straightforward. As we go through the workshop, I'll get to that. Okay, so logistics. So this is training that is based off of container dot training, which if you ever want to run through this or something like this at your own pace, you should probably go directly to the source and go to container training. Um, I heavily modified it to support everyone sharing a single Kubernetes cluster uh, because the original training assumed that everyone had their own cluster and that could be problematic from a cost perspective, but also from a bandwidth perspective if everyone's trying to run Unikube in like a conference workshop or something. Um, so I sort of did a lot of work to make it work on the one cluster. And then more recently, I wrapped it inside this particular workshop um, tool, uh, which is an open source tool called Educates that is uh, being developed by VMware. Uh, and pretty much anyone can build and run a workshop uh, using it. Um, hopefully you're all on the Zoom. There is also the Twitch stream if you feel the need to uh, follow on there, if Zoom is taking up too much resources or you are uh, working somewhere that doesn't allow the use of Zoom. Uh, this workshop takes between four and five hours. So we're not going to do the whole workshop. We're just going to get through what we get through. Uh, and then we'll leave the workshop up for a while if you want to continue at your own pace. And you can always go to container.training and spin up Minikube or Kind and sort of go through it there as well. Um, 
So it here is the first. Room. Absolutely, I would love to. All right, thank you, sir. So when Paul says he's going to leave it up for a bit, think 24 hours at most, all right? Um, it, he won't say it because he's really a, a kind guy, but it's costing him a couple hundred bucks uh, to run all this stuff behind the scenes here. So um, please don't get gripey if it, uh, if it disappears on you, you know, in a, you know, tomorrow or the next day, all right? That is true. Uh, but if you are in need of a cluster and can't get one for whatever reason, uh, feel free to reach out to myself or JJ here or on Twitter or wherever you like to speak to us, and we will make sure you have a Kubernetes cluster you can use. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Um, so here we have, see this yellow box with the little man? This is telling us that is, it is a thing that we can run on the Kubernetes cluster that we have access to. And not only can you run it, I mean, you can do this, right? You could write kubectl cluster info. Um, but like that's a bunch of typing for no good reason. So just click on it uh, and it will run for you. <laughs> now, sometimes you might wanna type it in because you might learn better by actually doing. So kind of use the copy and paste or type it in at your own discretion. Uh, you will not be penalized either way. Um, I showed you the editor, I showed you the slides. Um, we also have a console. Um, by the way, this is the largest workshop we've ever done with, where I've got a hundred slots. Um, I don't think we'll use all hundred slots, but uh, it'll be interesting to see if there's any weird uh, shenanigans running a, a uh, workshop of this size. So bear with us, but this is a uh, this is Octant, which is a web-based sort of Kubernetes dashboard that will not get you hacked, unlike the standard one. Mm -hmm. um, ordinarily, Octant actually runs locally on your machine and gets your credentials when you connect to your Kubernetes cluster. And so it can only do things that you are allowed to do. Um, here we have an embedded, but it still only has the permissions that you have access to do. And we'll talk about that right now. So back at our terminal. So because we're all using one big cluster, um, we have to try and protect uh, the cluster from uh, all of us uh, trying to perform naughty things and also protect us from each other. So we are using role-based access, access control. Um, and each person is restricted to their own namespace. So uh, with kubectl, you can actually get it to tell you if you can perform certain actions. So you can see if we hit this first button, um, it has a response of yes. Uh, and then if I say, can I delete namespaces? It will come back and say no. Let's see if I can increase my font size without going crazy. I think I can, okay, good. Um, so that's pretty useful, right? Um, it lets you just say, hey, is there something I can, is, there's an action I wanna do, can, am I actually authorized to do it? Um, so that's, we've got you fairly well locked down. Uh, if, you, if you're a Kubernetes uh, hacker and you really feel the need to hack the cluster, uh, feel free to give it a shot, but don't do anything that's gonna ruin it for the rest of us. Uh, and if you actually do manage to do something that you don't think you're supposed to be able to do, uh, let me know and I will, uh, see if we can fix that because it will be a bug. Um, so we can start to think about, we can start talking to Kubernetes and learning about our clusters. Um, actually, I should actually see, I always forget to go back and forth um, with the slides. Um, as you can see, there's a lot more detail in the slides. Um, yeah, you see, I should have had these up when I was talking about uh, <laughs> hidden room namespaces. Um, so we're not doing this stuff locally for a number of reasons. A, because like if you've got Windows or Mac or you know whatever, a bunch of ways to install stuff is different. If you're using your work computer, you might ha not have permission to install apps. Um, and then also usually we're at a conference or something and there's limited Wi-Fi. And so because of that, we sort of wrap all of that, this up into sort of a single workshop environment. Whereas as long as you have a web browser with even pretty limited um, 
uh, bandwidth, you should be able to perform this action. We're never really going to build any containers. Um, and now that's for not just the bandwidth reason, but also security reasons. We don't want to be running Docker uh, inside Docker and having to allow privileged containers. And basically, we just blow away any of the security we just tried to set up for the cluster. Um, yeah. So we did this, we did this. Where do we get to? Oh yeah. Hey JJ, do you wanna like give some like basic what is Kubernetes? Oh uh, yeah, we have, we've actually have a nice little conversation going on in the chat about um, Windows containers or Windows and Kubernetes also. Um, I know I know you have opinions there, CZ. Um, but the short of it is is if you don't know what Kubernetes is, we assume that you coming to this this workshop, you at least acknowledge that Kubernetes is a major player in our industry. The if you don't know at all what Kubernetes is, it is an orchestrator for containers. You give it a container, you say, hey, Kubernetes, run this thing. As long as it's part of the cluster and it's running something called a kubelet on the different nodes, it will run the thing. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a framework to be able to run containers. So as you've ever played with Docker before and containerized a small node app, you run Docker run, it runs on your laptop, great. Then you wanna push it into something closer to production to make sure it's always running. That's where Kubernetes comes into play. Now there's a, lot, a huge ecosystem around it. And what we're gonna do and teach you in this, in this workshop as you walk through it is enough to be truly dangerous with Kubernetes to understand how everything kind of plays together. Is that, is that good, Paul? Sure. So um, there's a number, there's a bunch of stuff you can ask Kubernetes to do. Um, you can just say, hey, I've got this app that I've already built. Um, I want mm -hmm. you to start like five containers that all run that app. And then I could put a load balancer in front of those containers. Um, and then I might need to start up 10 containers of an actual web front end, right? So I have an API, now I have a web front end. And then I can put a public load balancer in front of those. And then as events happen, I can scale those up and I can scale those down. I can upgrade those applications as I roll out new features. Uh, and then, one of the things that Kubernetes is really good for is it helps us do things like rolling upgrades. So even as my application is upgrading, uh, the web requests and stuff coming to my app will continue to function. And we'll talk about a little bit about how that works later on. Uh, it can also do auto scaling. So right now we have a, we're sitting on a cluster that should have about 10 worker nodes. And it is actually set up to be an auto scaling group of the cluster itself. So if we absolutely hammer this cluster, it's gonna just say, okay, no worries. And it'll spin up like up to five extra like physical uh, compute machines. Uh, and if we're not using them, it'll spin them back down. And so that's for the cluster itself. It'll do the same for your uh, containers, your containerized applications. If you enable, uh, they have the horizontal pod autoscaler and the vertical pod autoscaler, depending which direction you wanna scale. Um, yeah, you can also do like batch jobs or cron jobs. Uh, you can, we talked about RBAC, you know, fine grain access control. Uh, if, if you're really proficient with Kubernetes, you can be running your databases and other stateful services on there. Um, I've certainly been running, uh, like I've been running MySQL on Kubernetes in production since 2015, um, which is probably a little bit earlier than when I should have. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly like, last year or so, uh, there's tons of databases that are running on Kubernetes and there's a lot of good tooling out there to help us do that. Can I, can I jump in? Automate. You can indeed jump in. I just want to re-emphasize re, re the fine grain access control. Um, there's a strong possibility that people may have heard of something called Kubeflow out there, which is the ML story on top of Kubernetes with the big data and all that jazz. Uh, one of the beautiful parts of Kubernetes is, is that you can actually, the knobs and dials, you can zero in to the, the worker nodes that only have the GPUs, for instance. So you can run, make sure, make sure your uh, ML, what's it called? Uh, what's the word? Um, 
the thing that the, the does the work. Oh, I just went brain dead. You know, the thing that actually does the ML thing and Model? makes sure it actually models. Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly the, the, the models actually run on the correct machines. The beauty of the beautiful part of Kubernetes is that there really are truly fine grain controls inside of it. Um, and it looks like CZ, we have a question about a little bit more about databases on Kubernetes. You want to follow up on that? Oh, sure. Um, so the reason we're starting to talk about running databases in production on Kubernetes is we have stateful sets and we have uh, persistent volume claims. And so stateful sets ensure that uh, machines have, uh, uh, machines that your containers or your pods have specific names, so they're easily discoverable. And when you tie them together, and they also start in order, um, regular deployments will just like all start at the same time. Often with a stateful uh, clustered database, you need them to start in a very specific order um, so they can have appropriate elections and stuff. Uh, you also have persistent volume claims, which can be attached to a stateful service. And that ensures that uh, a particular member of your say Cassandra cluster will have you know a, a 100 gig database a 100 gig volume or whatever attached to it from your block storage and if something goes wrong with that pod it will spin up another pod of the same version of Cassandra and it will reattach that same uh, data storage to that pod even if it's if, even if it's on another uh, Kubernetes worker and so between those two things, it kind of gives us most of what we need to be able to do general, like start a database and keep a database running. And then folks use jobs and other stuff to be able to perform, you know, backups or um, data migrations or uh, extra sharding or, or whatever they need to do. Um, and often now that is all wrapped up inside a thing called an operator. And an operator is when you basically take everything you know about running a piece of software and you write that as software and you basically have um, sort of that software then manages your application on top of Kubernetes. Uh, and there are CR CRDs which let you extend the Kubernetes API uh, that go along with that so that you say, hey, Kubernetes, I want an etcd cluster of size pink and the etcd operator knows what size pink means and it will create you a cluster of that size and it will keep that cluster healthy. Um, has anyone ever uh, seen the, Kub the Kubernetes architecture diagram before? Looks like OpenStack to it's, me. Uh, it, <laughs> well, it's, you know, there's way less boxes than <laughs> you would see in OpenStack. Um, but it looks pretty scary. Um, and like when you're looking at the super fine details, it might be this scary, but the reality is it looks a little something like this. JJ, do you want to give a real quick rundown of the difference between the control plane and the data plane? Uh, yeah, so the, the short of it is um, there are master nodes that are basically API endpoints. You tell the master the thing and it goes out to the nodes and tells it this is the state that I want, it's desired state. And anything can be a node that runs something called the kubelet, which is not actually, oh, there it is. It's the one that's kind of, so it's kube proxy and kubelet. That is the core of what a, a, a node is. And the master gets the, the call, distributes the work to the kubelets. Is that good TLDR? Yeah, that'll do. Um, now we have a bunch more words, but I feel like we could probably just get on to some actual, let's just get hands uh, on. Actually, actually hang on, hey, uh, Paul, real quick. There is a, I don't know if this is tongue in cheek um, because I actually don't know. Um, it looks like it's a Hadoop layout. Is that an accurate statement? I don't know nothing about Hadoop myself. Um, Yeah, I'm not quite sure exactly what you mean there, Michael. Hadoop has two masters and a bunch of nodes. 
Well, I mean, any, any oh, distributed yeah, okay. system, I guess. Yeah. 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 It, basically, any distributed system, any platform kind of looks like that. It has a control plane and a data plane. Uh, and hopefully, there's some redundancy in the systems. Does the note uh, on that slide note... mean? Yeah, go ahead. What was that? Was that the. So, because we're all going to Podman now, that's, that's what we're going to be doing. Yeah, so. We're going to. <laughs> Sorry. Do Docker to... is not necessarily going away, uh, but what came out of Docker and how we do com containers is uh, CRI, which is the container run in time interface. And so a lot of that has sort of moved out of the Docker binary itself. And folks are starting to use Container D and other things as an alternative to running Docker, where you may not need to have uh, a daemon running as root, uh, and so you might inherit some extra security. But certainly, right now, today, the majority of Kubernetes clusters are still running Docker. Um, I'm just going to pop right through to. I'd, I'd like to say, uh, to, I'd like to say to, to Jared's point, he he thought that the. Uh, Kubernetes was an orchestration for Docker. The, the, the shortest answer, that is true. Um, there's more to it, but to put your correct mind space in what Kubernetes is, that was the original like concept is it, it ran the container for you in a production like way. Um, there's a lot more to it, but it's a really good first step to understanding how to use Kubernetes in a, in a much larger sense. All right, so we're going to use a tool called kubectl or kubectl or kubectl or kubectl, uh, as some tro trolls like to call it. Mm -hmm. um, there are some battles that happen on Twitter about the correct pronunciation. Uh, we could care less, so feel free to pronounce it however you want. Uh, and just know that whatever way you pronounce it, it's bound to be wrong. Um, Ordinarily, you have a kubeconfig file on your local machine, and that sets up the context for what kube cl cluster you're connecting to and what authorizations you have. Um, that is happening inside of the workshop uh, that you have, uh, so it's not really being exposed to you. And in a way, it's kind of the new SSH, where you know you're not specifically SSHing into as a machine, instead you're like SSHing into like the cluster as a whole and giving commands, right? Um, blah, blah, blah. All right, here's some things. All right, so let's go ahead and run this kubectl get node and see what's going on. So first of all, you can see we said get node and we actually got a bunch of things, right? So generally speaking, you can use the singular or pluralized version of any of the um, nouns. Are they nouns? Nouns. I think they're nouns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it will still give you what you want. Um, so you can see that we have, and this is only showing us our, our uh, data plane, our worker node. It's not showing what our uh, control plane is doing because our control plane in this case isn't running uh, kubelet and therefore is not considered a, a node from this perspective. Uh, you can see I have a default pool and then I freaked out because I saw how many people were signed up and so I created an extra workshop pool. Mm -hmm. um, and so that lets you like think about like if I wanted to I could set up some uh, some labels and then taints to ensure that you couldn't run any work workshop containers on the default pool or vice versa. Uh, and that gets to where JJ was talking about the, you know, the finer grained controls. I haven't done that. So as far as Kubernetes is concerned, when it's scheduling, it'll schedule your activities across all of these and not really care other than like who's currently got enough free resources to run this container I'm about to throw at you. Um, so I do want to just jump in um, real quick um, and say yeah. that Matthew Brown said, can KS be used to build a hybrid cloud, uh, a hybrid cloud and on-prem job scheduling or batch processing experience 
do perform odd workloads such as batch patching Windows, Linux, SQL DBs. I want to acknowledge that, that that is a natural progression for people to think about Kubernetes and the beauty of a unified API to compute. That is a brilliant thing. But unfortunately, there is so much underneath that cover that that is not what we're going to talk about during this workshop. And that is a time that we should sit down and have, um, that's a different conversation with many more details. We bring in something called a service mesh. We bring in so much more that that's, that's not in scope for this. Yeah, but the, the short answer is yes. Um, really what you're talking about would be using it as like a glorified um, distributed confab system, uh, which is totally something it could do. Uh, you would just need to put a lot of work into getting it to like connect to your databases and connect to your Linux servers and stuff like that. Um, so I we just saw run, that, I, I, you know, I just run FreeBSD. Is that okay? Nothing, nothing, Crickets. no jokes, Crickets. nothing. <laughs> nope, no jokes. So here we have like this output and it's pretty readable by me as a human, right? As long as my screen's not small and it wraps and as long as it's not too long at output, uh, but much longer than this. And as a human, I probably shouldn't be trying to read it. I should be getting a computer to parse it and then give me some kind of summary, right? And if I want to do that, um, I want to make it machine re readable. Oh, first of all, I'll show you what non machine readable looks like. If we say dash O wide, it's going to give us a lot more information about our nodes and you can see it's starting to wrap and it is definitely starting to be unreadable. So we can say, give it to us in YAML format instead. Uh, and that is even more unreadable for me, but it is more readable for a uh, computer. We could also pass it to uh, give me JSON, right? Um, and then so I could do JQ, which I think we have installed. And you can see JQ is colorizing it. And so we could start like querying down. We could do like JQ.kind, right? And see, okay, we're getting a list back. And so already programmatically, we can start interrogating the responses we're getting from kubectl. So we can really start to abuse that and we can say pass through to JQ and for each item grab its name and its capacity. Right. And so we run that. And so for each item you're seeing here, for each node, we're seeing the name and then we're seeing what shows up under just status capacity. Right. And so you can see it, it's very quickly starts to become obvious and easy how you can generate reports or get like usage data or whatever um, from this, you know, massive pile of output it might be giving you. Uh, if you ever want to know about a particular thing, you can run kubectl explain and give it like a resource and it will give you a bunch of information about that. Uh, and that's really useful, right? Because that's introspecting our actual Kubernetes cluster we have access to first reading some documentation and hoping that documentation is up to date and matches the version of Kubernetes that you're running. And so instead of jumping around like Kubernetes docs and the Kubernetes website, you can use things like kubectl API resources and kubectl explain to actually just ask your cluster themselves uh, stuff you can do. And so we can do that. And then we can also use uh, describe. And that kind of gives us a bit more information about a particular thing. So if we go ahead and get to that bit. Um, so we can do kubectl describe nodes. Again, way too much information, like super crazy amounts. So we can then say, let's just look at this one node. So let's hit this button right here. Still a lot of information, um, but it's just that one node. Uh, who, have we got any, uh, oh, never mind. Um, now let's have a look at, so that's describing things. So when you run a container in Kubernetes, you're actually 
running that container inside of a pod. And a pod is effectively the execution environment in which one or more containers share. Uh, and by that, they share network and volume. So they, they can talk to each other over local hosts. They can share files between each other, uh, as well as the RAM and CPU and other stuff that you would expect. So we can go ahead and see what pods are currently running on our cluster. And it's telling us there's nothing running in our namespace. So you all would have been allocated a, name, a namespace that looks something like this, and you're getting there is nothing running. So namespaces are how we segregate uh, people and information from each other and workloads from each other. So if I hit kubectl get namespaces, I'm going to get an awfully long list of namespaces, right? So all these namespaces, which we've all been allocated, as well as a bunch of stuff like kube system, um, educates, default, uh, and a bunch of other stuff, right? So these are kind of the, aside from educates sitting there, these are kind of the default ones that you would get on, on a given cluster, um, performing like the, the bare minimum things that Kubernetes uh, does. Uh, so when you run kubectl by default, um, it either uses the default namespace or it uses a namespace that's been specified in your kube config, in your context. Um, in our case, it is not the default namespace. It is whatever you've been allocated. So mine was S triple double zero one. Yours will be whatever yours is. Um, so if I do kubectl get pods again, that's saying there's no pods in that namespace, in my namespace. If I, however, run with all namespaces, it's gonna give me every pod running in every namespace. And the reason it lets me do that is because I've specifically set an RBAC rule to say, it's okay for any of us to get a list of resources called pods. But I certainly couldn't delete well, I could, but anyone, any, anyone else on the cluster couldn't pick a random pod in another namespace and delete it, right? You would only be able to do that to pods in your own namespace. But for the, uh, to give you the ability to explore, I sort of allowed some of the listing and reading capabilities beyond your namespace. Uh, and you can also use dash capital A if you're uh, adverse to typing, uh, and it's the same thing as doing all namespaces. JJ. Yes, so we had a couple questions say? about uh, namespaces at a little bit higher level. Um, one of the questions mm -hmm. was, so are namespace folders or, or containers within containers, are they just objects? Are they simply pointers? So you, the, to, to put your namespaces in context is the way to logically break up your Kubernetes cluster. So you could take a manifest that is in dev, QA, and production and be able to run that manifest against dev, QA, and production namespaces because they're arbitrary names and actually have the exact same um, uh, application running that cannot, well, in most cases, cannot talk to one another. So imagine namespaces as a way to kind of cut and slice and cut the things up. And that goes back to the cube flow comment I made earlier, where you can actually hard, you can RBAC specific hardware to specific namespaces. So when somebody runs something in a namespace, you know for a fact it only touched something with um, a, a GPU. Uh, so, so namespaces can be security boundaries among, among other things. Uh, yes, the, the short answer is yes, there are some caveats to it, but in the general way of thinking of it, it, it is a, a walled garden inside of your Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, and it is absolutely a, a logical construct, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you then tie things to that logical construct, like RBAC rules, etc. cetera. Um, we, could, we can think of it as a security context or a, con or a context boundary, um, sorry, security boundary, but it's not like the same like hard security boundary of like two physically separate machines or even two VMs right? Because it yeah. is still a logical construct uh, rather than a physical construct. Um, so that is definitely, in the same way a container, you know, is, uh, you know, shares a namespace with uh, other containers. 
so it shares the kernel of the OS with other containers as well, right? So it's not like a hard security boundary like a VM is. So a lot of the default security boundaries in Kubernetes, Kubernetes are kind of a, a softer security boundary uh, that can be hardened in, in ways, but maybe aren't as hard as you would like uh, at, first, uh, at first glance. And that's why a lot of folks uh, are still using um, actually multiple Kubernetes clusters to, to provide that hard security boundary. Um, you know, they might put dev and stage and prod on different clusters, or they might put different business units or even different applications on different clusters. And so you just kind of figure out the risk uh, level that you're willing to accept. And then you sort of architect how you use the Kubernetes, mm -hmm. Kubernetes around that. Yeah, IBM Cloud is great for multiple Kubernetes clusters. Just saying. Well, so Sponsored by cloud. IBM. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if we wanted to look at pods that are just in the kube system namespace, we can specify that namespace in the get pods command. So if we go ahead and hit this, we will see again, we have permission to list pods in other namespaces. So that's why you can see this. Um, you certainly couldn't again, delete one or edit one or whatever. Um, so that's pods, right? That is running your actual application. Now, when it comes to accessing your application, um, you could try and figure out the IP address of an individual pod and then like ping that or curl that from another pod, depending on uh, a couple of things like network security policies and other stuff would determine if you can do that or not. But that is something you could do. But then you're trying to figure out IP addresses, you're trying to do all sorts of stuff and that's not ideal. So basically we have this concept of a service which gives you a stable endpoint to not just an IP, but I guess an IP and port combination. Uh, and they actually perform load balancing for the things that it's supposed to be um, managing. So if we go ahead and do a get service, like it says here, and we're doing this in the default namespace because we actually have a service in the default namespace. Every Kubernetes cluster uh, has, or at least should have this service in the default namespace because this is what allows anything in the cluster to access the Kubernetes API. You still need to authenticate against it, um, but you have an easy way, like any application running in the cluster, if it needs to talk to Kubernetes, it can always look at the Kubernetes service in the default namespace. So you can see here, it says cluster IP as its type. And so that is an internal IP address that is only available inside of the cluster. So realist, like effectively only containers and pods running in your cluster can access other containers and pods through a cluster IP service. Now we can run this command here, which is going to, what are we doing? Uh, we're getting the Kubernetes service and we're collecting its IP address, right? And we're doing that inside of another command so that we're effectively curling against that and hitting dash K because you know who cares about security. Now, because we're running the workshop inside of the cluster, we, we actually get a response here, but you can see the response we get is a like permission denied, which is what 403, right? And so I would need to actually pass it valid credentials and log in to be able to get a real response there. Obviously outside of the cluster, um, I wouldn't be able to access that if nothing else, because it's a private IP address, right? Um, but while we can access cluster IP um, services from inside of our workshop, we're gonna pretend that we can't and from here on out, we'll use other techniques to access our applications, either through getting load balancer services or by doing other tricks and interesting things. 
So we can go ahead and actually run an application. Oh, and that was the other thing I was going to point out. So all of this, all services get a DNS record, right? And that DNS record is if I'm in the same namespace, I can just use the name of the service. If I'm outside of the, that namespace, I have to use the name dot namespace dot SVC, I believe it is. Is that right, JJ? Let's try it out. Cool. Yeah, that, that's right. Kubernetes. I'm here. I'm eating dinner. Sorry. Dot default dot service. K isn't it not local? So it's local. Well, you can do all. You can do a full like local. I think it's service up cluster or local. Um, yeah. But this is enough to resolve okay. it through. Right. So as long as you know the name of the service, and the namespace that service is running in, you get like automatic service discovery via DNS for your services, which is super useful because you never have to care about IP addresses, which is pretty sweet. And you can always say if your database is always in the same namespace as your application, you can configure your application to simply go to like, uh, was it MySQL as if that was a real thing, uh, database 3306, right? Uh, and as long as you have a service in your namespace called database that actually points to your MySQL, this will always work. So that's one less thing you need to configure in your application. Uh, because it's always going to be that hard endpoint. Um, we have a question, CZ. Uh, yeah, why, why can we not access the cluster IP? Is it due to security risk for non-admin users to do? Um, no, it's just because it is a container has an IP address on the container network, and the container network, by default at least, does not span outside of the cluster. And so as we go through, you'll see there are several other service types that you can use, um, like a, a node port or a, a load balancer, which then uses tool uses things like natting um, to expose those internal IP addresses to external uh, things. And I think we show that in a bit. So we're going to go ahead and actually run some containers, acknowledging that we're not running containers, we're running pods, and our containers sort of appear inside of that pod. And we're going to be running, at least to start with, a fairly simple ping command. Recently, Kubernetes changed the way that kubectl runs things. Uh, and that's making things a little bit tricky right now for when we're doing demos, because based on the version of Kubernetes you're using, the kubectl run command will act differently. So let's go ahead and have a look at, first of all, what version of Kubernetes we're running. And you can see we're seeing the client version, which is you know this guy, and the server version, which is what we're talking to. And you can see that this is, I mean, from here, you can even guess that we're actually running in GKE. Um, and I do that because I like to show that our stuff uh, at VMware doesn't just work at VMware. We try and be uh, agnostic and make sure that things we do works everywhere. Um, and so we're running in GKE. This is a GKE cluster. Uh, it is connected back to uh, Tanzu Mission Control, which I won't even mention again, other than say that it's a thing. Uh, and you can see we're on version 1.16.13. And so if we look back to here, um, we are in the up to 117, uh, not the from 118. Um, so here is where we run the kubectl run command. And I will flip to here. So we can go ahead and run this command up here. Uh, and you can see we get this lovely deprecation message. Um, and so that is what we see here. Uh, and it's telling us to use this run dash dash generator, blah, blah, blah. I could not be, I could not be bothered with that. Um, if we had have done it in 1.18 or above, it would have just said pod created. 
Now, interestingly, if I do a kubectl get all, I don't see just a pod. I actually see a deployment, a replica set, and a pod. Uh, and that is because previously, when you run, ran kubectl run, it would actually create a deployment. Uh, and we'll get into the difference between deployment and replica sets in a bit, I think. Um, otherwise, someone remind us and we will cover it. Um, so that's kind of the big difference. The version we're running, we're getting deployments from kubectl run. Newer versions, you're just getting a pod. Right, so we just ran the kubectl get all. I was ahead of myself. So we're going to go ahead and actually creating a create a deployment the proper way, and we're going to destroy that app. Uh, and so we're going to run this command. Uh, anyone want to tell me what double pipe does in Bash? You're getting anyone? or in the chat. Yes, that is exactly it. Thank you in chat. Um, so basically, if this first command fails, it will then attempt to run the second command. If the first command passes, it won't attempt to run the, the second command. Uh, and so that's a useful trick for things like this. So now we're going to use this newer way of creating uh, deployments by using create deployment. Now, when we create a deployment, we can't actually specify what command to run. So you can see in this previous here, we actually have the image Alpine, but we're actually telling it to run that command. Oh, see, this is why you don't highlight things in the run box, because it then runs it for you. Uh, that's OK. I can delete it here. Um, so in the newer version here, uh, we don't get to specify a command. So because of that, we have a custom built image that already runs that command as part of like what's baked into the image. So we can go ahead and hit that create deployment ping pong. Uh, and it says deployment created. Uh, no more deprecation uh, messages. We do a get all. And again, you can see we have the deployment, the replica set, and the pod. You can see that's my old pod that's still cleaning itself up. So we could ignore that. Now, what's happening inside of this container, right? I've deployed it, but really, like, I can say kubectl get all, but like, that doesn't tell me diddly squat about what's actually happening. So, so everything that is logged in your containers to stand it out ends up in the Kubernetes logging system. And if you are smart, you're then sending it to where, Laura? Log DNA. Good answer. Um, but we're not smart. My bots will be happy. So we're, so we're just using kubectl logs. And so this is kind of a more of a ephemeral logging system, right? Because there's not really any guarantees that your logs are going to remain for a long time. But it's good enough to see what's kind of happening right now. And so I ran kubectl logs. And it's basically from the creation of that uh, pod um, to the last thing it said, it's going to dump that out. Sometimes I actually want to know what's happening right now. So I can use uh, dash dash tail one to say, just give me the last message. And then also dash dash follow, which will then like actually follow the log. So now I run that and I'm seeing the log, the log responses at, as they happen, which is just this constant ping of uh, localhost. Right, and so that's in real time. You're seeing them happen every second. Um, like most things on Linux, you escape it with Control C, except for Vim, which you can't escape. So we have our we have our deployment, and we have one pod. If we want to actually run more, because I don't know, I'd say we're expecting a heavier load, but this is just a ping, so it doesn't really work, but we'll go ahead and do it anyway. We say to Kubernetes scale, uh, deploy ping pong, and three replicas. And now if we do a kubectl get pods, you'll see we now have three copies of our pod. Um, whereas if we do a k get all, 
um, you'll see we still have a deployment and a replica set, but you can see there, it's seeing that there's three needed and there's three ready. Um, Michael, we will talk about deployments, I promise. I think we have some, uh, some pretty pictures that describe it a little bit better. So we'll save it till then. Um, and if we don't get to that point, then we'll give a, a rundown without those. All right, so we have three pods running. So now we need to get um, the logs from each of them. And so we hit this guy and we get this response. We found three pods. We're using this pod. So by default, kubectl logs doesn't show logs for all of the pods in that deployment. It picks one and then just shows it. Um, and that is totally a shortcoming. It is a potential problem. And there are ways to actually look at the logs for all of the pods in a deployment. But this kind of just shows that it's not always as obvious as you think. Like, because you could see this, right? I said, show me three. You could be excused for thinking that you're getting, you know, one log from each, uh, which is not the case. And you can see it's also con consistently giving me that same pod, right? Um, so somehow it's deciding that that's the first one and that's the one it's always, always going to show me the logs for. Uh, and we'll show you more about how the log logs work in a mi in a mi in a minute. Use your word, Paul. Uh, but we're going to start to talk about how Kubernetes handles resilience, and this is where deployments uh, come in. So let's catch up to where we are. All right, JJ, do you want to do you want to take a swing at this? Uh, yeah. Or are you still eating? Is that a yes? I don't know if JJ realizes that you're muted, JJ. No, it turns out my, my, my thing started talking to me when I was, it was frustrating. Anyway, yes, so a deployment. The thing started talking to you. Yes, the computer talks to me. It's weird, it's very weird. Um, okay, so the short of the deployment is you, t like right now what we've been doing is we've been telling Kubernetes, here's a container inside of a pod run this thing. A deployment is you declaring hey, JJ. more. Hmm. JJ, work off, hmm. work off the slides. I haven't seen the slides, man. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, I did the workshop. I didn't actually figure right. out about the slides. Well, Go you, ahead. You can, see, you can see the slides now, right? So start with uh, a yeah. pod and we'll work our way up. Okay, so a pod ha can have n number of containers in it. Pods can't be moved. That's actually a really, really important thing. Um, if they get destroyed, they get recreated somewhere else, which is also important. Um, pods cannot be scaled. Uh, so you have to send more. You, you, if you have one pod, it is one pod, it is one pod. Um, it can have n number of containers, which is also really, really important to know. Um, our friends at Datadog is one of the examples I like to use, where you could have like your application and then a, another uh, container inside of a pod that is like the Datadog log agent or log DNA's log agent, whoever you are talking about, um, and it can ship it off to that. Uh, and it runs on one single node. It, pods are, are unified to, me to run on one node to make sure that happens. Um, it, is, it is a collection of containers where n number of containers, where n is n plus one, so it's always at least one container inside of it. Um, a pod cannot crash. That's also a really important thing to know. Um, it is the container inside of it that breaks. The pod is just a construct around the entity that is the, 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 the collection is a good word for it. Um, then uh, they may or may not get restarted. Um, so there are policies you can have with different pods and, and um, the actual declaration of how to do that. Um, the, if a pod ends, if you've done it like as a batch job or something where it, it's done a bunch of work and you've spun up a n number of, of pods to do that work, it, it goes into succeeded, which or succeeded and or completed, if I'm correctly. Um, it's not just succeeded. And that's the status that we've seen earlier. Um, 
And then if, a, if the, one of the containers inside of it fails, for instance, you don't have networking working, so it can't get out to the real world, and you have the log DNA slash Datadog agent inside of it, and it can't talk to the outside world and it goes into a failed state, um, Kubernetes is smart enough to put the whole, in, the whole thing into a failed um, status. Uh, replica sets are a way to scale pods. So as you saw earlier when we were playing around, um, when we scaled up the number of um, uh, ping containers, for instance, that is in essence is creating a replica, replica set of, of five, if I'm correctly, or three, three right, right there. Um, and that, that is, you have a desired state, uh, ah, go back. You have a desired state of three, how many current um, are, is how many exist. And then the ready state, there's actually multiple things underneath ready. It's, it can be, for instance, Java, right? If it's Java, the joke is it takes forever to start. So you can actually have something called a live witness probe and a readiness probe against it to make sure that it comes up into the ready state you expected. Uh, one of the questions is, can I create multiple instances of a pod? When you say pod, you can't scale, do you mean the number of containers inside of it? Uh, uh, Mohammed, so you can absolutely have multiple instances of the pod. You can scale pods horizontally to the point where you have no more compute. It's n plus one in essence. Um, if you go back to the other one, CZ, real quick. In that case, we had three, uh, the replica set of scaling of the pods of ping right there at the very top, right under the gay get all. Uh, k get all. Um, we had three or two plus one, I guess, pods in that case. Um, now. The pod is the collection of containers. So if you, bad example, but to put your mindset around it, um, imagine a three-tier app, right? You've got your, your uh, web front end, your application. Use WordPress, use WordPress. <laughs> web front end, application layer, and your database. That would in essence be a pod, if you think about it, with three containers inside of it, right? And you can have n number of those um, those three, uh, th those pods with the three containers inside of it. Now that's a bad example when you actually think about it in the Kubernetes space, but if you imagine the containers as entities, for instance, log DNA, Datadog, and your application, that would be a pod. Does that make sense, Mohamed? I'm looking for a yes. I'll say yes on his behalf. Perfect. Um, if there are too many, Okay, perfect. If there are too many pods, replica sets will d delete some. So you can declare how many replica sets or replica sets you want for a distribution. So if you say, um, well, there you go. I defined it by the pod template and the number of desired replicas. If I want six, I will get eventually six. It is eventual consistency. Um, it has to find the place to be able to get the containers to be, or the pods to be spun up and ran. Um, and if you doesn't have enough space, it will, it will complain saying it doesn't have enough space to do it. Um, if there are too many pods, it, replicas will delete them. So if I said that the, I wanted 20 and now I need to scale it back down to 10, it will terminate 10 of them, which we should be doing in the example very soon. Again, back to the, so we can scale up and scale down replica sets very easily. Um, it brings in conversations around automation for like lo load traffic and all that, that's out of scope for this conversation. There's a lot more to think about that. Um, and please don't worry, you're, being, you, you're seeing the, the power of Kubernetes already if you, if you made that logical jump. That's a little bit more advanced than what we were talking about right now. That good, CZ? Yeah, I was just gonna quickly do this. Uh, come on. And that's also me not ever seeing these slides before, by the way. Just saying, just saying. Nothing, nothing, nothing at all? Okay. Nothing. Nothing. So you can, when JJ was talking about it, a uh, replica set being basically a pod template and a set of replicas, if we look here, unfortunately, there's a bit more to it. Um, but you can see here, uh, where are we? here's our spec. So we have replicas three, and then we have this template. And this template is a pod template, right? And so while you could 
scale pods by creating more pods yourself. Kubernetes is like, well, that's easy. I can take a template of a pod and, uh, and like run 10 of them or run three of them or switch between three to 10. So rather than me having to manage 10 copies of a pod myself, I can just say, Kubernetes, here's a template, run 10 of them. Oh, wrong button. All right, so that's replica sets. JJ, deployments, final piece of the puzzle. Yes, so deployment is the Uber-ish, right? It is the thing that declares in, a, in YAML that this is the, the application you want to run. And the best part about it is that it can roll forward, roll back, and it's declared via YAML that you can put into Git. So you have a whole world of from the pod to the container to the replica set, the, the, the Venn diagram, if you will, deployment is the thing that you actually manipulate to deal with all the things underneath it. Yes, you can absolutely run one-off containers as we've seen earlier, um, by, or pod, pods and containers as we've seen earlier. But when you are actually doing this in the real world, you touch the deployment manifests to be able to change things. As you can see, the replica set controls the identical pods, so you can scale up and scale down to what you need. Um, you can roll out different pods also, which is very, very important. When you update a deployment, a new pod definition, like you, when you update a deployment, it takes the state of the previous deployment and stores it and then takes the new version. So if you're changing from version 0.2 to 0.3, for instance, you change the deployment to do that you still have deployment point two in on the back burner, if you will, but point three is the one that's actually showing out. And there's intelligence around it too, to make sure that it comes out in a successful way, which we will see later on in this, in this workshop. Um, the rolling update, oh, the new replica set is created by the, the new pod definition. Oh, you're just gonna highlight things for me now, CD? Is, is that how it is? Um, and then and what basically the beauty of it is, is Kubernetes is smart enough to roll things out in a programmatic way uh, using the deployment mechanism. Otherwise, as a human, you would have to change the replica set and the, the, the pods by hand and to see the state. You trust the bots to do the work for you. Um, and then when you scale up and down a deployment, the, uh, it scales uh, the replica set also. So imagine it's a Venn diagram and things start to slowly but surely make more sense. All right, um, so now we're gonna clean up uh, the things that we just uh, did before we move on to the next step, steps. Oops, I went too far. Um, oh. Did it not, did we miss this? Oh, I think we're good. We don't need to delete that stuff yet. All right, I think, yeah, that's why, because we'd already gone past here. Where do we get to? All right, so we're gonna show some of the resilience we get from having uh, replica sets and deployments. So if we go ahead and clicky on this fella, it's actually gonna run a command in the bottom terminal. Uh, and that is a, a watch on our pods. And so if we go ahead and delete one of the pods, you can see here, we're just like picking, picking one and passing that in. Uh, and so it's picked that one and you can see I've got one terminating, but it immediately created one to replace that. And that's because I have told the deployment that I want three replicas and it's not aware and it doesn't give a fuck that I then went and deleted one of the pods, right? Because it's intention overrides my intention. And so it then immediately replace the pod that I asked it to delete. So the only way I can change pods, change the replicas, is by using the scale command or the equivalent of. So if I really only wanted two running, I can't just delete a pod. I need to actually specify a new desired state of only having two replicas. And then I let the deployment work with the replica set to make that happen. Right. 
So that is pretty cool, right? And so even if you only want one copy of your application running, you only want one pod running, you almost always should reach for a deployment because A, you want it to recover on failure. If the, if the worker node disappears that your application is running on, a deployment or a replica set will recover it. But also from the deployment, we want the rolling upgrade capabilities, which we'll see in a little bit actually how that works. So therefore, like you always reach for a deployment. So while pod is kind of the, the unit of compute, it's really dumb and not that interesting. And we should be reaching for deployments or we should be reaching for things like jobs instead, which manage those pods for us in a more intelligent way. All right, executing batch jobs. So, you know, deployments, replica sets, they are great for applications that we wanna just have run forever. Um, pods are fine if we just want a quick one-off execution. Um, but if we want actually like proper long background work, we want scheduled events, then we reach for jobs or cron jobs, right? So prop, job, jobs are run this thing through to success and cron jobs are run this thing through to success at a set cadence. And the cron jobs use the exact same format as a Unix cron job. Uh, with all the stars and numbers, which you're probably familiar with. So we can go ahead and create a job. Uh, and we're gonna create a job that is basically gonna do the equivalent of flipping a coin, right? It's gonna pick a random number, uh, one or zero, and use that as an exit code, right? And so let's go ahead and run that. Uh, Paul, real quick, just to, just to follow up on a question, uh, what do you mean by a set cadence? It's just like a cron, it, it is in essence a cron job. So you can set it for every- Yeah, so I- three, yep. Yeah, exa exactly. So every five minutes or every 10 hours or like every weekday at 3 a.m., stuff like that. Is that when you back up uh, your MySQL so we'll go database? Ahead. That's every when weekday. I back up my MySQL <laughs> database. <laughs> you know, you don't have, you don't, you don't work on weekends, come on. Yeah, of course not. <laughs> uh, yeah, even, even, even the computers need a day off. <laughs> so we can go ahead and create this job and it's going to create it and we'll see it completed. I guess mine was successful. So it's not running again. Um, hopefully someone, hopefully people are seeing errors and if you see an error, it will actually try and rerun it um, and it will keep running extra pods until it succeeds. Um, so we can now look at the pods that I, that, that job created. So you can see, we use this thing called a selector. And I think we talk about that in a bit, but that selector just lets me say, I only want to look at pods that match the job name of Flipcoin, right? So inside of the pod that the job created, there's some kind of label, uh, that joins those two words together. Uh, and you can see the, you go, the, the first one completed, therefore it doesn't need to run a second time. Uh, probably half of us got a failure. Now on the scheduled jobs, cron jobs, um, we use these numbers and stuff. And I think, can I, did I? Oh, I did link it. So you can see here, this is kind of how these numbers and stars work out. So if I am all stars, I think that's saying, run every single minute. Um, whereas down here, it's saying run this on the first minute of midnight past midnight. So this yep. will run every day um, at one minute past midnight. You can see here, you can do minute, hour, day, month, and then day of week. Um, with the amusing thing that some systems actually allow you, allow you to choose seven for a Sunday. Um, that's cron jobs. That's exciting. Uh, so let's go ahead and create a cron job. Uh, and you can see with every three minutes. Um, so that's by saying star slash three, that's basically um, equivalent of doing every three minutes. 
from from the and moment it was created from the moment it was created. from the moment it was created yes. yeah so it will not run for three minutes um, so we'll just kind of leave it and come back to it but we can do a get cron jobs and see you know here's the here's the details on the job we created um, last schedule none it hasn't run yet uh, etc so at some point we'll see it pop up down in this bottom screen as it pulls a pot up. Um, and if we hit this, so we do get jobs. We're still in a sync flip coin, but basically when this guy finally gets that job scheduled, uh, when I run this again, we'll see that it's created a job to actually perform the work. And that job will then create a pod where the work is actually done. So this is kind of that layering of abstractions that Kubernetes done, does to take a really dumb thing and put intelligence around it. Um, so labels and annotations, there are, there's a lot of things you can do in Kubernetes, um, especially when it comes to, to uh, restricting things or uh, whatever. And we use labels and annotations to help determine uh, what things happen. Everything from a service knows what pods to uh, route traffic for because they have a certain label. And so uh, that's one thing labels are used for. And annotations are used for other things, um, which I think we talk about later. If not, um, you can remind us to come back to it. Oh, oh here, look, there's our job. So there's our job running. Um, so if I do uh, get jobs, um, I'll see Flipcoin uh, completed successfully. Um, and in another three minutes, we'll see another job pop up and do the same thing. Um, but we want to have an explore of uh, labels and annotations. Uh, let's just see if I'm missing anything. I think that's pretty much. Yeah, so here it talks a little bit about the difference between kubectl run and kubectl jobs in the older versions of Kubernetes um, before we switch to the kubectl create terminology. Um, but we can kind of ignore that. Labels and annotations. So yeah, we'll go ahead and create our deployment. So we'll hit this button here and we should see a new uh, web container has started up at the bottom here and it is already running. Uh, I can describe that deployment and it's going to give us a bunch of information. And in that information is labels and annotations, right? So you can see we have one label that is app equals web and we have one annotation, which is deployment revision one, right? So this is how Kubernetes keeps track of what revision uh, it's at for when you're rolling deployments forward or backwards. Uh, and then labels are used by selectors to figure out um, what needs to be done. So we can use the selectors to find out the name of pods that match that selector. So I know that my application is called web. Uh, so I can run this selector app equals web, and that's going to give me the list of pods that are part of, that have that label. Uh, and I can then use trickery to grab just the first pod and then describe it. And there we have the description of, of the pod. Um, you can see a lot of information there. Um, and in here, we'll see that it has two labels, uh, like so. So app equals web, and then a pod template hash. Um, and so app equals web came from the create deployment. And the pod template hash is assigned by the replica set, right? And so this is how the replica set knows uh, what replica set is managing this pod. All right, and then you can see my second three minutes job is running down there. 
So let's look at how else we can look at labels. So I can do uh, kubectl get and show labels on a bunch of different resources. Uh, and so that's going to dump out um, for pods, replica sets, deployments, services, and nodes, all of the labels. Not particularly useful, um, but kind of shows you, you can kind of, you know, start getting specific and looking at different resources. Um, if we want to actually set a label or an annotation, uh, we can use the kubectl label command. So here we're going to give our web deployment a, a, a label that is color equals blue, which is something you might do if you're going to be doing blue green deployments, right? Um, and then so now I can say, um, let's look at the deployment and JQ just to metadata labels. And you can see we not only have app web, but also color blue. So if I have a, uh, a service that is load balancing um, for a deployment and I want to do blue green deployments, I would switch the selector that that uh, service is looking at from red to blue or sorry, from green to blue, et cetera, right? And so that's how the service would start rep, uh, load balancing traffic to the blues versus the red and vice versa as we upgrade through. Um, JJ, you keep keeping track of questions and stuff? Yes, sir. Trying to do my best. Laura's, Laura's right. helping out too. All right. So that's kind of that out of the way. So we'll go ahead and kind of clean up that web deployment just so it's not sitting around. Um, and now we'll come back and look at our logs. Now you remember before we did a get pods, uh, oh, first of all, make sure that ping pong still running. It is, and we've still got this command down the bottom, just watching pods anyway. So we know that it is. Um, now you remember we ran this command and it only showed us logs from one of the pods. Now we know about selectors. We can actually use selectors to select for a particular label. And that will allow us to do multiple pods. As you can see here, this command, we're doing dash L, which is, you know, look for labels that match. And this is app equals ping pong. And so now it's not giving us a warning about the uh, picking, picking which pod, right? And you'll get three logs, because if you remember, I, I randomly scaled my pod, my replica set deployment down to two. You'll all see three because you didn't do that, I don't think. Um, but you can see it's not telling us which one's coming from where. So this is still of questionable value. Um, if you're trying to figure out like if one of the pods is having problems, one of the replicas, like this isn't really gonna help me find, figure that out. Um, and then of course we can stream our logs, right? So this is gonna stream our logs. So every second we're getting two responses. Every second you'll probably see three responses. Um, and that's fairly new. Um, since 1.14, 1, 1 it's not really fairly new. Um, that's because 1.14 is probably a couple of years old now. Um, however, there are some hard limits to the number of uh, logs we can follow, right? Because we don't want to blast the Kubernetes API. Like you think of all, however many of us are doing the workshop, all trying to look at like a ton of logs, it's going to potentially uh, mess with things. So I just, told it to scale me to eight pods and it's only given me five. Uh-oh. Or is it just that's too much stuff going on? Let's do that again. Oh yeah, that's fine. There's eight. I was just off the screen. Um, yeah, that'll be fine. Ooh, for a second there, I thought I'd run us out of resources or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so now if I try and stream logs, it's gonna flip out because it has max log and tuck currency to five. Um, I could set, I think on the server, um, I don't think I can run this here. Oh, I can, there you go. All right, so just by default on the client side, there's a default max of five. Because um, you think about it, I'm, 
asking the API to, to collect all these logs and then string them down to me. It wants to try and make sure that we're not just logging the API for no good reason. Um, but, you know, I mentioned we weren't seeing what pod was sending what lines. Um, if pods are restarted or replaced, the log stream just stops. Uh, if new pods are added, we don't see their logs. So all this stuff is done, like when I'm setting these selectors, at the time I ran the command, and therefore it's not seeing changes. Uh, and then we have to use a selector, right? Uh, so there's a bunch of external tools that start to address these shortcomings, one of which is called Stern. And so with Stern, I can simply just run Stern ping pong. And this is going to do the same thing as KubeCutter logs, except you can see here, it's giving me like the names of the pods and it's actually colorizing them. So I can sort of start to see an idea of like repetition and stuff, right? Um, so that's now actually giving me a bit more value. And I could probably, if it wasn't so busy, start to see like errors and stuff happening in there. Or I could do like, I could be doing like a grep or something if there was a particular error that I wanted to look for, like it was giving me 403 errors or whatever, which clearly it's not, but I guess it picked up some 403 numbers there anyway. Um, what was it? What did I just run? Stern. So now we can say, just show me new logs and actually give me timestamps, right? So this is only showing me new stuff as they're coming through. It's giving me timestamps. So you can see I'm starting to get the sort of information I would need to actually do some real debugging. It's still not replacing the functionality of something like log DNA, but it is certainly uh, giving me some immediate uh, information. So it may like, it may be a quick thing for me to do a quick kube catalog looking for a specific 403 um, before I jumped onto something like log DNA and did a deeper dive into what's going on historically and compared to like my current set of logs to maybe what I was getting three months ago or something like that. Um, we can use uh, labels and selectors just like we were before. Um, so I can run this here. And so, oh, this is going to look at logs for everything that was created with kubectl create deployment because kubectl create deployment always creates an, a label that starts with app equals something, right? So here I'm saying look at any log for things that are apps and ping pong is the only thing running right now that has that label. But if I had some web apps and stuff running, I would also see those. Uh, and as usual, control C to exit. Um, that is kind of it for ping pong. So let's kill that off. And we'll also kill off our uh, job and our con job. Do we want a quick uh, break for a, a couple of minutes? We've been going on for a solid hour. Um, yeah, that's probably a good idea. That's probably a good idea. So let's take five. We'll come back at uh, uh, 740 or 1940 if you're European. Uh, and we will continue on for probably another half hour or so, and then wherever we get up to, we will wrap it up. See you. And when we come back, we'll have a real quick announcement from someone out in the group about a new meetup. Perfect. Okay, I'll take a break. You can talk too if you want, you know, but granted, this is recorded. Just remember. I've, uh, I've really appreciated how uh, interactive this has been so far. Um, you guys are really awesome for, uh, you know, kind of inlining everybody's random <laughs> queries and such. Part of the fun. Yeah, th thanks, Jared. That, that means a lot. We, we, we pride ourselves in our ability to be accessible and like we, we want everyone to be successful, right? And this shit's hard. We're not going to lie. It's, it's hard to understand and hard to do. And the best thing we can do is, is people to help this community is to be here to make it, make it better. Yeah.
fun thing about Stern is it makes lots of pretty colors while it's running. Oh, Stern is crazy. The more you get into it, like when CZ yeah. first showed it to me, I was like, oh my God, this actually tells me the things I need. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I started wondering if I could put this in like process mining and stuff, but she's right, like a centralized management would be nice. Because I was like, oh, if I can just get this in a text file, I could process mine this. And I'm just looking, I'm like, oh, yeah, that'd be rough if there's an error. Um, this is a lot to digest. No kidding. Um, so so as, as CZ said earlier, that um, he and I can easily get you Kubernetes clusters that are relatively long lived and relatively um, free. Uh, but if you have, um, if you have, if you want to just play with something, the when I usually tell people to look at something called kind, K-I-I-N-D, is <clears throat> Kubernetes and Docker. Um, you'd be very surprised on how far you can get um, learning, learning Kubernetes. Yeah, things like kind.sig that kubernetes.io, fuck, I don't remember. I'll, I'll see if I can find the link here in a second. Um, but it's, it's, it is very, it's, it's generic enough and for Kubernetes to match every single major cloud provider out there. Uh, th thank you, Laura. Um, the one small disadvantage is that uh, someone was mentioning earlier about EKS and the other options of running Kubernetes. Um, there are, like if you use AWS and you're an AWS shop, obviously you're not gonna to wanna to spend your time learning Azure's Kubernetes service and services that um, also exist inside of Azure, right? So there's, there's a much larger conversation about where you run your application and how you run your application and what, what infrastructure. It, but the kind is the lowest common denominator of Kubernetes, if you will, so that it will work, like if you learn how to use Kind, you can learn how to use the core services of Kubernetes across every single cluster, or every single cloud, sorry. Is that is that right, CZ? Yeah, that sounds about right. For the most part, Kubernetes smells like Kubernetes no matter where you're running it, um, but abstractions do leak. Mm. Um, and so therefore there are sometimes things that do look different on different uh, providers. Uh, and that's where doing things like annotations comes in. Um, it's not the case anymore, but it used to be if you wanted a service of type load balancer in uh, Amazon, uh, you would need to actually set some annotations to make it actually work. Uh, that's been since, long since fixed. Um, but you do definitely see uh, interesting things happen um, that aren't normal and therefore have to be solved out of band. Um, and thankfully, Kubernetes has things like annotations that allow you to uh, make that happen. Um, but for like standard, like, you know, the three magic things you need to run an application, uh, like a, a process, a disk, and a network, like those three things are pretty consistent across the providers. It's when you start getting into the deeper details where you find new and interesting things uh, that are different. Uh, Laura, you said we had someone with an announcement? We do. Jarrett, you wanna let us know about your new meetup? Yeah, so uh, I moved here uh, about three months ago and uh, immediately started looking for, you know, nerd related uh, meetup stuff and so on. And um, so I, I noticed that there wasn't a community yet for uh, home labbing. So running your own infrastructure at home for fun or usually not profit, but you know, uh, something. Um, you know, as an example, I, I have um, a, uh, a Nextcloud instance and uh, a bunch of other random things um, running uh, at my home lab. So uh, I created a group for that, and I will paste the link in the chat here. Um, and the idea here is to, um, you know, help anybody who wants to, um, you know, connect up with this and, uh, and, and uh, connect together and, uh, and learn from each other. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking we can do some, you know, 
kinds of workshops like like this one here. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe one of our first projects will be uh, how do I get Kubernetes running at home? Right? No, wow. stop. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we'll we'll, we'll see. <clears throat> hey, as long as it's composable infrastructure, awesome. it should be fine. But um, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, please feel free to join and. Uh, um, you know, uh, that goes for all of our hosts as, as well, who can, uh, you know, try to dissuade us from, from doing this. <laughs> well, no, just, just running Kubernetes yourself. So, that's, that's, oh, that's well, what I I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> that, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> so a couple of folks are talking about running, uh, K3S on Python, which actually sounds like a, sounds like a really fun project. So yeah. if you were to run a workshop like that and maybe put like a, like an Amazon wish list or something together for those of us that don't have the equipment but do have the disposable income. That could be yeah. a fun project. And I know JJ and I have actually been uh, talking on and off about running things at home. Um, mm -hmm. JJ is super into the idea of running Postfix at home and running his own mail server. <laughs> oh, good lord. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke. That is definitely a joke. <laughs> We're gonna run, he's going to run Horde M for is it square cube? No, round cube. What's the anyway? Round cube. Yeah, it's round cube. I'm showing round my round age. cube. Okay, well that would be fine. So that's just just a front end, but yeah. Uh, squirrel right. mail. So. Um, <laughs> squirrel mail. Yes. Uh, but actually, JJ and I are involved in a podcast where we've been talking about such things. Oh, so okay. if you enjoy the sultry tones of JJ's voice, uh, Google for the Drunk and Retired podcast, <laughs> uh, which is actually. Uh, Kote's podcast from a long time ago, we've sort of, uh, we reinvigorated it and then Kote got bored and had a baby, so hasn't been participating as much, but JJ, myself and uh, Matt Broberg have been running with that and having some fun. Yeah. And the topic of home lab has come up a number of times and own cloud and next cloud and all that stuff. Yeah. One of, one of the big benefits is, you know, this is, this is costing you guys a fair amount of money. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're standing things not necessarily this specifically, but things like this up on your own hardware, you know, you are the one who's in charge of how much storage you get. It, you know, you're the one who just mm -hmm. like kind of makes the CapEx up front and then you don't have to worry about like dumping hundreds of dollars out the door. So yep. but yeah. just for playing around. I mean, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there's a, a limit on my Google account, but if someone was really savvy with a for loop, it could probably cost me a couple of thousand dollars extra through this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully don't nobody that. is that cruel. <laughs> <laughs> JJ, don't do hey, it. That it, it, it did cross my mind. <laughs> right. All right. Um, so let's jump back into this thing. So we blasted through all this nonsense. Uh, we blasted through that. It is way quicker when you just ignore the slides and hit buttons in the, in the workshop itself. Um, now, here, here we take a quick moment to talk declarative versus imperative. And so a lot of the way we've been doing commands have been uh, imperatively. Uh, and that's kind of because it's easier to say kubectl run or kubectl create deployment than it is to write a 600 line YAML or JSON file. Um, if we ever do want to uh, run things declaratively, that is when we start looking at, um, if we pop into here, like this is uh, a declarative way to get an HTA proxy pod, right? Because I'm I'm describing the resource I want in YAML, and then I pass that to Kubernetes with kubectl apply. Um, and here I'm not giving it actions, I'm giving it desires. So I want, a pod. I'm not saying, like, I'm not giving these instructions, like, go create a pod and make it run this command. I'm just simply saying, here's a thing I want. You know how, you know how to make it happen. Uh, go and do it for me. And so that's kind of the imperative versus declarative. So declarative is, give me a cup of tea, right? And the assumption is the person I'm asking knows how to make a cup of tea. The imperative is, well, I need you to boil some water pour in a teapot, add some tea leaves, steep it for a while, serve it in a cup. Uh, and if you're British, you add the milk before you add the hot water because they don't want to burn the tea leaves or some 
nonsense. Um, British people are weird. Uh, so declarative seems simpler, right? But it only works if the person you're asking knows how to do the thing you're asking for. Um, blah, blah, blah. More information I think we kind of covered. And there is an ISO standard for brewing tea if you care about such things. And I'm sure it doesn't tell you to put the milk in first. Yeah, please no. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So imperative systems are simpler and declarative systems are more complex. And usually when you get declarative is when you start dealing with like complex distributed systems where um, you know, state isn't necessarily guaranteed. Flappy words, mouthy things. Um, so we're gonna quickly look at what's actually happening on the cluster when we're saying this thing, this is that imperative version of like create deployment. So here is our uh, control plane here. And these are our, this is our data plane, our worker nodes. And what's gonna happen? I am a DevOp and I'm gonna say kubectl create deployment web. And kubectl is gonna talk to the API server. And the API server is going to create a deployment entry in etcd, which is Kubernetes' database. And it's gonna say, cool, done. It doesn't care if it actually succeeds or not. It just cares that it was able to create that entry in etcd, right? So as far as I, as the viewer is concerned, it's, it's done, even though it's not actually done. So what's happening here under the hood then is, uh, where was I? Yeah, uh, the API server, the, control ma the controller manager sees that deployment show up and it's like, oh, I'm in charge of, of deployments. I hold the logic for how to handle deployments. Therefore, I need to start performing actions. And the first action it does is it creates a replica set based off the number of replicas in the pod template. So now we have, and this is still an etcd, right? So then the controller manager sees there's a replica set and it's like, oh, I'm also in charge of replica sets. So I have to perform an action. And so it does, it activates the replica set portion of its logic. And that is, I'm gonna create a pod. And so it creates the etcd entry for a pod. So now we have an etcd entry for a pod. We still have nothing running. But what happens is the scheduler knows that it has to wait, it has to do things to determine where to put a pod when, it's, uh, when you want one. So the scheduler now kicks in and says, oh, node one has free resources. I'm gonna stick it there. And so node one is then watching for that and goes, oh, you've just asked me to do something. I'd better perform an action. And see, this is all happening through the API server. So the only thing that's ever talking to the database etcd is the API server itself. So the kubelet is like, okay, okay, you've got something for me to do. Give me the pod spec uh, in the pod entry. And that it then coordinates with Docker and, uh, and or container D or whatever is running to actually make that uh, container run inside of a pod or that pod run. Uh, and it reports back that it's healthy and, and we're running. So that is when you create that deployment, that is all that's happening. So there's a lot of stuff happening just to make that one pod run, but all that stuff is ensuring the resiliency and everything else of our pod. Um, and that is I've how we can get to the point where we can declaratively ask for a deployment and trust the uh, controllers to make that happen for us. All right, so real quick, we're at five minute warning. So the Kubernetes networking model, uh, effectively we have uh, one big flat IP network that uh, our nodes and pods run on. Uh, it is actually more complicated than that, um, but given the time we have, we will ignore the complication. Uh, effectively, everything inside the cluster can 
breach everything else. You can obviously put in network security policies to stop that sort of stuff. But generally speaking, if you're in the cluster, you can talk to anything else running in the cluster, at least from a TCP sending you a packet perspective. Um, so pods have level three IP connectivity. Services have level four. So services are focused at TCP or UDP and specific ports. Um, and kube proxy is the thing that actually kind of manages that in the back end and makes it work. Uh, and it works with the container network interface, which allows you to plug in different types of network uh, topologies and stuff into Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, so the slides are up. Um, they're already up. Uh, and you can see the URL for the slides right there. Um, I will paste that into chat. Uh, and those slides, these slides will remain up for as long as I have a website. Um, lots of stuff going on. Let's just get to the thing. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So Kubernetes has a resource of type uh, called service and service kind of address how the networking is happening. Uh, it gives us st a stable endpoint to connect to a pod or a group of pods. Uh, and we can use the kubectl expose command to imperatively create a service. Uh, and so we say this right here, kubectl expose deployment. We give it our deployment name and then a port. And so that's going to go ahead and set up the service and it's going to use this it's going to look at the labels for the deployment and it's going to use that as the selector for the pod uh, for the service and therefore the service will then load balance uh, via the cluster IP for any service that has the right labels based on this and then they're given an internal DNS zone. Uh, so we don't need to worry about IP addresses, everything is names. Uh, we have cluster IP which talk, we talked about. We also have node port which will NAT uh, a port on the public IP of your worker nodes into your pod. And then you have a type of load balancer, which, which will actually go into your cloud provider and configure a load balancer and connect it to the node port, which is then gonna connect to the cluster IP, which is then gonna internally load balance for your application. So that's kind of how we get traffic from the outside world uh, all the way into our pods. And when you've created a load balancer, you'll get a, 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 like a, a good static known IP address and you can wrap DNS around that. And then you have a usable website or whatever it is you're running. Uh, blah, blah, blah. We talked about these. Um, so real quick, we can actually run some commands. Oop, too far. All right, back to my terminal destroy that. All right, so we're going to watch kubectl get pods. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and create a HCP uh, env deployment. And we're going to immediately scale that to five. All right, so we're going to see five of these running. Uh, and then we're going to use kubectl expose to dis expose that uh, on port quad eight. So we're going to do that. Uh, and then we'll do a get service. And you can see we have this right here. And so now we have our service and we can grab the IP address of that service, which we will do with this little tricky command right here, um, which is basically grabbing the service and looking at the cluster IP endpoint. And so if we wanted to, we do a echo IP. Uh, and we could actually do a curl IP and 8888 and there's our response from our application right which is just printing out our environment variables in as a JSON document. Um, now assuming I was outside of the cluster um, and I wanted to get into the cluster so I could access the cluster IP I could do something like this. So we have a we're running a pod called Shapod and it basically has a shell in it and what we're doing is, is we're telling it to run the command sleep 4800. And so that container is going to sit there and it's going to just sleep for that, that many seconds. It's going to complete, it's going to exit, it's going to finish. But what that lets me do is this, 
trick right here is I can run kubectl exec into a pod and then run commands inside of that pod, right? So here we're gonna use that IP address we just collected and we're gonna run a curl from inside of that pod. And you can see that's the same response we had up here. And so this is one of many ways you as a Kubernetes admin can access things like cluster IPs from outside of the cluster. Um, and yeah, that's a bunch of garbage. We can pump it through JQ and just look for the host name and that's it right there. And we can loop that five times and you can see the host name changes because the service is load balancing across the five machines we have. Um, I can't remember the exact algorithm it uses, but you can see it did get two from the same uh, pod there. So it's not a, exactly a, a round robin. Um, we can do a describe and kind of see these endpoints are actually our pods, uh, the IP addresses of, of our individual pods. Um, we generally don't need to care about those, but sometimes it's useful. If I know one of them is flaky, I could potentially try and get to a specific one of them because I could actually do, uh, I believe I can actually do that. So if I want to only get to that one for debugging, I can kind of make that happen as well. Uh, and then we have DNS. So if we do a lookup uh, on DNS, um, you can see we get, um, looking at HTTP N, we get our uh, IP address, which is our cluster IP. And there's the fully qualified DNS uh, for that. Um, so we could use its host name. So here we're doing a kubectl exec again, and we're using the uh, HTTPN instead of the IP address, and we're getting the response. Um, and then we could also be using the FQDN. Again, I'm sort of using some tricks to determine the namespace. So I can use the fully qualified DNS here. Um, but effectively, I'm getting the same thing. Um, so there we're seeing in practice using the names as well as the IP addresses inside the cluster. Um, and that's kind of it for that uh, example. So we'll go ahead and delete that and we'll delete the deployment. Uh, and I feel like this is probably a good place to wrap things up. We are at time and the next set of uh, demos takes a hot minute. Um, so uh, I guess we'll wrap, we'll wrap up. Um, keep, keep logged in if you wanna keep going through the training. Uh, there is a fair bit more to go, uh, hopefully more to learn. Um, you can try and catch up to where we got to on slides if you want to look for more information um, or just keep rocking on with the information on the left, uh, which isn't as detailed, but it's probably enough to keep it going. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, JJ, any final words? Uh, no, no. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions in the chat. Uh, and if you have any other questions or thoughts, uh, we ha you have the ways to contact all of us. Um, yeah, Laura, you want to wrap it up for us? Do you, do you want me to stop the recording now? I do. So then, yep. Uh, it's up to you. I really don't mind either way. Um, just as a reminder, the cluster will be up for less than 24 hours. Uh, please do remember that Paul is paying for this. So be kind, please, and try not to run anything ridiculously crazy on it. Um, Ross is gonna cut off all your access, I hope. Anyway, uh, so just a little reminder about that. If you have any more questions about how exactly this will work, um, this was the UK8 thing. So if you're really crazy and wanna have a little bit of fun trying to put it up on your own, go right ahead. Uh, there was a link in the chat for that. Anyway, well, thank you so much, JJ, Paul. We, well, especially Paul, JJ, I probably should get the order right this time. Um, thank you all for doing this. I'm Everybody really said that they really enjoyed it, and I hope you all actually did. You'll be seeing a little bit more information about the next bunch of meetups in the uh, coming future. We're trying to get them scheduled out a little bit earlier than this one. Um, you might see one for beginner DevOps. I'm still trying to get that up. For those of you who heard about that last time, uh, just trying to get that organized and settled with some initial speakers. And one more call out, Dog Days of DevOps is gonna be next week. Uh, that's Cloud Austin's mega meetup of lightning talks. So if you are interested in giving a lightning talk, also, you can call it an Ignite, but 
they're not really being really picky about the slides every 20 seconds thing. If you're interested in giving one, head on over to the meetup. You'll be able to see where you can link to the Cloud Austin one and you can propose your own talk. Highly recommend you do that if you can. Um, it's a lot of fun. I hope that you guys also sign up for it because I think y'all you you all will enjoy it quite a bit. So on that note, thanks for attending. We really appreciate you being here and we will see you next month. Thanks everybody.